Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for, for being here. And uh, um, I'm excited to dig into God's word together. So we've got uh, some in the room, uh, Alice online. We've got another couple that, that should be joining us online here shortly, but maybe just to start, let's uh, go around the room and let everybody introduce themselves um, just so that as, as we'll be growing together in God's word for the next Next 12 lessons, uh, it might be good to, to know one another. And um, yeah, so just a name. And, and if you want to say something about yourself, you're welcome to do that too. Ron, you want to start us? So, yes, I'm Ron Prater. Um, uh, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> well, not really. I was born on February 29. Oh, so you're a young one. In 1948, yes. Okay. I had my 18th real birthday. Um, not this past February, but February before. All right. <laughs> so I got to relive 18 over again. Nice, nice. <laughs> this one threw me a party, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> <laughs> but worth every penny, right? <laughs> it was. It was great. Oh, um, we're from McDonough. Uh, I'm originally from West Texas. Okay. And uh, I'm proud of it. So there you All go. Right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Lou. We're together. She's a Georgia peach. All right. There we go. Okay. My name is Olivia Garcia. Um, originally, I'm sorry. Olivia. Olivia. Uh -huh, Garcia. Uh, originally from Mexico, um, but I've been here for the last 30 years. Okay. I have two kids. <laughs> one, um, is, one will be 23 in May, and my youngest one is eight. Okay. I am Victor Cox. I'm from Wisconsin originally, but I've been down here for a few months now, working and getting to know everybody down here. And definitely happy to be here and happy to be here on Thursday evenings with all you guys. Hi, my name is Mickey Grandville. Uh, Mickey? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and uh, I'm a retired Navy. And uh, I'm engaged to this beautiful young lady here. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, and we're looking to get married soon. When she, whenever she says you're ready. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but uh, other than that, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to meet uh, new people and new faces. Wonderful. <laughs> I'm Sharmita. I'm originally from Georgia, so I'm also a Georgia Keaton. And um, we currently live in, in Covington. And so I'm excited to be with the class today, and I look forward to learning a lot. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I'm the only one. <laughs> I, I got 21 great grandkids. Right. So I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Experienced, we said. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, I'm all quit. <laughs> I'm Madeline Kelly. Yeah. Wonderful. Alice, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alice. Uh, I was born on 27 September 1986. And uh, I was new to this Georgia and Covington and Newton County as my husband got an opportunity to work over here. We have shifted for, recently shifted from India. He was working as a high school science teacher, Alcovi High School, Newton County. And I'm presently not working. I'm at house. Uh, I'm very happy and excited to listen to God's word and join you all. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, good. Let's start with prayer. <laughs> Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to study your word tonight. Thank you for bringing this group of people together to, to do exactly that. Um, we realize that uh, without you, we have nothing. With you, we have everything. Help us to uh, appreciate who you are more and more as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. All right. So, um, Alice, do you have the materials? Did I give yes, you the sir. Okay. Yeah, I have. I have online materials. Okay, great. Uh, so those binders are yours to keep. So feel free to write in them, uh, take notes. Uh, it's it's kind of nice that you know they're they're organized by topic. So if you're in a conversation with someone and you say, you know what, I want to find some Bible passages about this. Uh, basically, what you have in front of you is an outline with a bunch of Bible passages in it. Oh, okay. So we'll be working through that. 
Um, the passages in there are from the New International Version of the Bible. Uh, there's a lot of great translations out there. If you like a different one better, great. You feel free to use it, but just to have something to print, I, I went with that one. It's, it's usually pretty, uh, pretty easy to understand. Um, but uh, yeah, as we go through, this class is designed to answer your questions. So that means you have to ask your questions. Um, and, and don't ever feel like, oh, it's not pertinent. Because if it's poking up in your head, chances are it might be poking up in someone else's. And, and when you ask it, that might bring on another question. And, and that's when the class gets interesting. So if there's ever a point where we're going through something and you start feeling bored, that's your own fault. You're not asking good <laughs> enough questions. So, so ask, those, ask those questions. Hello, hello. Hey, Brian, how are you? Hey, Nicole. I tell you what, do you want to uh, sit next to one another? Madeline, you want to slide down, slide toward me a little bit, and that way they can sit next to one another. Yeah, I don't know. There you go. <laughs> So wonderful. So we are we are on uh, just just getting the introduction here um, in those binders. I was telling them those those are yours to keep. Feel free to write in them. Take your notes uh, on the on the front. There should be a page, or maybe it's in the back. I'm looking and I see the application in the front. Might be in the back a sheet that says my questions that need to be answered. Yep, uh, that is there. And if you don't have one, any piece of paper works. But um, I, I put that there because uh, a lot of times, you know, your questions might not come up just in while we're sitting here in this room. And as you're thinking about things, something comes into your mind. I encourage you to write it down, at least if you're anything like me, because I don't know how many times it's happened where I've thought of something and said, oh, I wanna ask, let's say, I wanna ask Vicar this when I see him. And then when I see him, I'll remember, I've got something I wanna ask you, but I don't, remember. I don't remember what it is, right? So write it down. Every week we'll start um, with, I'll ask you if you had any questions that accumulated over the week, and we'll start with that. That'll be our way to kind of review what we had talked about and, and then transition into the new stuff. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So ask your questions. Uh, the, the goal of this class is not for me to tell you what I think or what uh, a certain church teaches, or uh, even what makes sense. My goal, what I, what I want to do for you, is, is to point you to what God's word says. Um, and, and maybe I should clarify that. I believe that the Bible is God's word. I believe that, that God uh, speaks through it, that he has given it to us, that it is inerrant and infallible, and, and, and so it's trustworthy. I realize not everybody believes that. Um, I'm not going to be able to, to logically argue you into agreeing with me. That, that's not my purpose. My point, my goal is to share with you what the Bible actually says. Because I think a lot of people have heard Christians say things that they think is what the Bible says. And they have this caricature of it. And, oh, I can't believe that because they haven't actually dug in to find out what it actually does say. Um, so we're going to try to answer questions and cut through some of that confusion. And my goal is always going to be, let's look at what God says and where he says it in his word. Um, now, if you believe that the Bible is God's word, wonderful, you'll say, okay, that's our answer. If you don't, at least you'll be able to say, okay, that's what the Bible says. And now I can decide whether I, I believe that or not. And, and the more we're in the word, God works through that and God causes faith to grow in, in our hearts. And so, so it's just a beautiful, beautiful cycle. Um, so yeah, goal, we're going to get into what, what God teaches about different things. Uh, any questions on the introduction? And let's, let's open up to that first page there concerning God, chapter one. Um, you'll notice in this book, sometimes there'll be a question and then there'll be answers right below it. Uh, I did that so that as you're going back to it, you've got something there. There might be some times where I'll say, okay, uh, here's the question. Don't look at the answer yet. Let's talk about it first, just to kind of get some discussion going around it. Uh, but, but the first question there, is there a God? That, that might sound kind of basic, 
right? I'm guessing that I know the answer everyone in this room would give. Is there a God? Well, of course there is, right? That's why we're here. We're studying his word. But I'm also guessing that you probably know someone who isn't so sure about that answer. Or maybe there was a time in your life where you weren't so sure uh, about that answer. Now, how do, you, how do you answer that? Well, you say, well, yes, there's a God. Uh, how do you know? Well, because the Bible says so. And they say, well, the Bible is just a, a human book. No, but God wrote it, but there's no God. So how do you know? It, it's, it's, it's not a logically satisfactory answer, right? Um, so how do you answer? And that, that's what we're going to look at first with some of the passages that are here uh, where God shows us that there are more ways than just his word that show us that he exists. Uh, and then we'll also talk about how important it is that he has revealed himself to us in his word. So uh, you see a bunch of passages there, and you're probably sick of hearing my voice already. So what I do is we do the play or pass method, uh, and we'll just go around the room. And if you'd like to read that next passage, you'll get to do that. If you'd rather not, just say pass. And, and I'll encourage you, um, if your brain works like mine, feel free to pass. For me, if someone asks me to read something in front of people uh, that I haven't prepared or I haven't read before, as I'm reading it, all I'm thinking about is, oh, did I get that word right? Or what's the next word? And I'm not really paying attention to what I'm reading. But I know other people uh, learn better when they're reading it out loud. Uh, so if that's you, play. If that's not you, feel free to pass. Next person will, will read. So we start with, uh, you know, the question, is there a God? We talk about the natural knowledge of God, what we can know about God by nature. And it says the belief in God is actually logical. Why? So our first passage, Hebrews 3. Ron, you want to play or pass? I think I'll pass this time. Okay. Arlu? For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Okay. So the, the writer to the Hebrews there um, uses the picture of, of a house. We're in a building, right? So let's use this as an example. When you walked in here tonight, I'd be willing to bet that not one of you thought to yourself, I know how this building got here. There used to be woods here, used to be forest. Tornado came through the forest, moved everything together you know, and, and plopped it down. And here we have the building, you know, the stone got out there and the, the wood. Um, I'm pretty sure none of you thought that's how it got here. Um, if you thought about it at all, you knew that someone designed it, someone ordered the materials, someone put the materials together. There was, you know, there were blueprints. I mean, you, you just know that's how it works, right? And the writer to the Hebrews uses that picture with, with the world. Um, we can tell that a house was built by someone. Look at this world that has, you know, trees with, with fruit in it and the fruit falls and the seeds, you know, the, the, the birds maybe eat the, the fruit and then they, they deposit the seeds and another tree grows and that, and, and the, the, the bees pollinate the different kinds of flowers and all of these things that work together. Or, or if you've ever had a child, I'm sorry, but if you don't believe in miracles after, after uh, you know, childbirth, um, you can tell that this isn't an accident, right? And that's the first point here. Look at how this world works. Normally, uh, if, if something, if you give something enough time, it, it wears out. It goes from order to chaos. It wouldn't accidentally become order that, that we see. Um, so, belief in God, logical there. Let's read Romans 1.20. Olivia, you want to play or pass? All right. Uh, Vicar, you want to play or pass? For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Okay. Um, notice what, what he says there, that ever since the world's been here, two things have been clearly seen, right? God's eternal power and his divine nature. So, so his power. There, you, when you look around, you can see there's something more powerful than me, right? There's something bigger than me. And, and divine, it's something not human. It, it's something beyond uh, and he says, that's obvious so that we're without excuse, so that we can't say, oh, I didn't know that there was something else. I thought I was the end all be all. Um, no, we, we can tell. There's, there's something in this that says there's something bigger. Uh, Psalm 19.1, Mickey, you want to play or pass? I'm play. All right. 
Okay, that's my my favorite camping verse. You ever go go camping out in the middle of nowhere? All right, no city lights around, uh, and and you you go out in the middle of the night, and you just look up, and you actually see the stars. I mean, here on a clear night, you can see some stars, but I'm talking about when you actually see the the billions of stars, and and you you just stand in awe of it. There, there's nothing you can say except, wow. All right. But coming from West Texas, it's flat. Yeah. And it's primarily a lot of desert. Mm -hmm. So that means you can stand here and you can see all the way to Alaska and all the way to Monterey, Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just nothing but stars from one horizon to the other. Um, so as a Boy Scout, we go camping. Okay. Yeah, you know, we go up the Davis Mountains, and of course you've got pine trees. And yep. It blocks your vision. My son, when he was just a little guy, took him out to Texas, and he got outside where my parents live, and he said, "I like it here." I said, "You do? Why?" He said, "I can see." Yeah. And he, the only place he's been is Georgia, and of course pine yep. trees are everywhere. Right. Right. And he can't see yeah. other than just what he can see beyond the, the tree and then right. it's nothing. Right. So I always thought that was fun. It, it was, yeah. I can see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are certain scenes, whether it's whether it's the stars or you know, if you're standing on an on an ocean shore and looking out or on a top of a mountain and and you just you get that sense. I'm I'm small compared to what's out there. Right. Um, and and that, that next passage, you know, Psalm 14, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. For someone to say there's no God, God says you're fooling yourself. Right. So put all these passages together. What's the point? We can tell by nature that there's something bigger than us. We might not know what it is, but we can tell there's something out there. And, and I've had conversations with people who have said, no, there's no God. And I talk about things like this, and, and sometimes you get the answer, no, I don't feel that. No, I, I, uh, uh, I think you can explain it in other ways. So where do you go from there? My, my second question for them is always, have you ever felt guilty? Go on. <laughs> and, 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 and no one has yet answered no to that. <laughs> no, there's no doubt. Why are you feeling guilty? Well, exactly. Yeah, and that, that's why I asked the question. So uh, if everybody says, yeah, I felt guilty, of course, everybody's felt guilty. And so then why would that be if there isn't something that someone that we're answering to? And that's where these next passages go to. Sharmita, you want to play or pass on Romans 2? I will play. All right. Romans 2, 14. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consent is also bearing witness in their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that... Uh, Oh, yeah. Explain that. <laughs> yeah, th this is this is a kind of a complex sentence, right? So uh, this is Paul, and he he's writing, making the point we're talking about. But notice he he starts, he says when Gentiles. So um, for the the Jews of Paul's day, there were two kinds of people in the world. There were Jews, and everyone else, and so that's that's Gentiles. So the, the Jews had. Um, you know, the Old Testament, they had Moses and the prophets, they had the priests, they had the, the uh, um, uh, not sanctuary, what's the, the uh, synagogue, they had, you know, all of these ways that they could find out what God's word said. The Gentiles didn't. And notice what he says, he says, when Jews who don't have the law do by nature things required by the law, so, so they don't have the Ten Commandments, but yet they keep them, or they, they try to follow them. Um, you think about all the different law codes in the history of the world, whether, whether Hammurabi or Strabo or, or whatever, um, they all have some things in common, right? You don't murder, 
you don't steal, you don't rape, you don't, I mean, th there's things that everyone understands, those are wrong, other things are right. Uh, and, and Paul's point here is saying when the Gentiles realize that even though they don't have the law, they don't have the Ten Commandments, they have, the law. They have it, yeah, they're proving that it's been written on their hearts. Right, and and he says their consciences. Uh, you know, how does a conscience work? It tells you, hey, that was wrong, right? Or if you do something right and someone's complaining about it, your conscience tells you, no, no, that was right. Um, and he says that conscience is testifying to the fact that that law is written on our heart. And who wrote it on our hearts? Well, God. Somebody. Yeah, God. yeah. There's yeah. Whether you know the name or not, there's something out there that I'm answerable to. Um, how about 1 John 1, verse 8? Nicole, you want to play or pass? Okay. okay. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Okay. So if I say, no, I've never been guilty, I've never done it, blind ourselves, and everyone knows that, right? Um, Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, so you've got two things, right? You've got nature and just its immensity and its order and its power and its structure that says there's something. And then you've got your own heart saying there's someone that, that you're answerable to. Um, and, and so you, we can tell that there's something. But if you flip the page, that natural knowledge isn't sufficient for salvation because it doesn't tell us who that something is. It doesn't tell us what that, that someone ha has done for us. Um, number one says there is only one true God. Natural knowledge just tells us that there is a God, right? Because you put, you put the facts that our natural knowledge gives us on the table. First one, there's something more powerful than me. Second one that the conscience tells me, I've messed up, right? So if I have wronged if I have ticked off someone more powerful than me, that puts me in a bad position, right? Uh, I, I should expect punishment. I should expect uh, I got to do something to fix this, right? Uh, and, and that's all we have by nature. So now let's look at some of these passages. Uh, Psalm 96, 5. Uh, Brian, you want that? Uh, for all the gods of the nation, uh, idols, and the Lord has made the heavens. Yeah, there were a lot of nations with a lot of different gods, you know, the Egyptians with their whole system of, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Greeks and the, yeah, um, the Canaanite religions around the Israelites that had, you know, um, Bel and Marduk and, and, and Baal and Asherah and, and all of these. And the psalmist here says the gods of the nations are idols the, the Hebrew word there is hevel, which its root is a mist, right? You know, you go outside on a really cold day and you can see your breath, you, you see that mist, but you know, you swipe through it and there's nothing there, right? I mean, that, that's the picture there. So these gods, it seems like there's something, right? They've got their temple and they've got their priests and they've got all these people, um, but there's nothing behind it. It's just a statue, right? It, 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 but he says the difference, the Lord, the true God, actually did something. He made the heavens. Um, and, and in Acts 17, I, I won't make you read that one, Madeline. I'll, I'll read that one. Um, <laughs> the, the half a page there. You can kind of read it. I'll kind of skim it. Um, <clears throat> this is, this is taught, telling us about the, the Apostle Paul. So um, Paul was uh, the, that early Christian missionary he had been a persecutor of Christ. Later on in this course, we'll, we'll read the passage about his, his conversion. But, uh, but for now, this is as he is this missionary. He's going from town to town. He's telling people about Jesus for the first time. Uh, they've never heard it before. And he's getting persecuted for it because the, the Jews, uh, some of them said, oh, this is great news. And some of them said, no, 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 you're not going to change our religion. Uh, and, and tried to kill him. So he was uh, persecuted. He, they, they were surrounding the house to, to kill him in one town. Uh, and in the middle of the night, he snuck out the window and he fled to Athens. And so he's in Athens waiting for his co-workers to, to meet up with him. And Paul's doing what Paul does. He's going uh, through the streets and telling everybody he meets about Jesus. And, and so Athens was very famous for their philosophers, right? They're, they're, they're thinking, you know, all the great names of, of philosophy uh, usually trace back to, to Athens. Um, 
and so we we read in there, uh, you know, there uh, people are are debating. Paul starts telling about Jesus, and and there are some of these philosophers saying, "Hey, you know, I've never heard anything like this. You're talking about a guy raising from the dead. Wait a second, this, this sounds strange. Why don't you come to our meeting of the Areopagus? Uh, so this place where the philosophers would get together and they'd they debate and they'd talk about the latest thoughts." And, and uh, they said, why don't you come and, and tell us your, your thing? And so I'll pick up kind of in the middle there where um, verse 22, so about two thirds of the way down, uh, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. So I said they were big on philosophy. Uh, if you're into archaeology at all, uh, you can find a lot of proof that they were really big on religion. They had so many different gods and goddesses and temples, you know, some of the, you know, the, uh, the, the these huge uh, temples, even still standing today, um, there were, there were altars and temples everywhere. Uh, it's, it's, it's very amazing when, when you go through an old city like, like Athens to see how it was everywhere. So he says, I see you're very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. And so you think about why, why would they do have an altar for an unknown God? Think about how those religions started or the, the um, impetus for them. There are some things in everyday life that don't go like you would expect, right? You might have uh, two couples that are both trying to have kids. And, and one couple tries and tries and tries nothing. Another one, it's no problem, you know, all the time. And, uh, and you say, okay, why is that? They both look healthy. Well, it must be the gods, right? There must be, they must have, this couple must have displeased the gods. If, if they can offer a sacrifice or do something to get on the good side of that God, well, then they'll, they'll be able to, to have kids again. Uh, you know, Two farmers are farming and, and uh, one has a great crop and the other not so much. And well, we got to offer a, a sacrifice to the God of, of agriculture, right? Um, or war, that was a big one. Two armies seemingly, uh, you know, it looks like this one should win, but this one ends up winning. Well, they must have displeased the gods. We have to offer a sacrifice. So all these different compartments of life, they said, all right, we'll, we'll build an altar and we'll offer a sacrifice and that'll please the God. And then that God will bless us in whatever way that is. Notice as they're thinking about it, they're like, okay, we think this is how you please this one. We think this is how you please that one. What if we missed one? Or what if we missed the real one? Well, here's, here's one to an unknown God. And, and, and you kind of chuckle at that on the one hand, but at the same time, think of how sad that is. That's just living in that, in that fear. I know something's wrong and I'm trying to fix it. How do I do that, right? Um, but then what Paul says is, is so powerful. He says, now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. We talk about the revealed knowledge of God, right? The natural knowledge of God, just by being, you can tell there's something. The revealed knowledge is God saying, this is who I am. And that has to be revealed to us. We don't come to that by ourselves. God, yeah, he, he, he writes, he speaks to us through his word. Um, number two talks about the purpose of that. Why does he do it that way? Um, the purpose of the natural knowledge is that it makes us look for answers so that we can see the answers that he gives. Uh, X 17, Madeline, you want to play or pass? Oh, I'll try it. All right. <laughs> it's a little shorter. Yeah, for one man, he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the, the whole earth, and he determined the time set to them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Okay. You think about that. He determined the time set for them, the exact places where they should live. Look around this room and, and, and on the screen, and, and you see people from very different backgrounds, from uh, you know West Texas and, and Georgia and Wisconsin and India. Um, you see people with very different interests, uh, and somehow we are all in this room tonight studying God's word together. How did that happen? Well, God says, I did that. You know, and, and, and it might have been through a hundred little different things, 
right? Maybe, maybe someone got a flyer or heard about an event. Maybe someone got invited. Maybe someone was was uh, a, a, a friend told you about Jesus. Maybe your parents did, and, and now you're looking for a place. Uh, but God worked in our lives to put us where we are so that we can hear his word. Um, he said, you know, he, he did it so that we'd, we'd seek him and reach out from he's not far from each one of us he's right here his word is right here it's right there but he puts the natural knowledge in there so that we're looking for it um and, and because the natural knowledge like i said uh it it causes a problem because there's something more powerful than me and i've messed up how do i fix this uh people try to deal with that problem in one of two ways they either try to live lives of sacrifice, whether it's those Athenians, I'm going to offer a sacrifice here at this altar and that one and that one, or, or a lot of people today, well, if I can behave well enough or if I, if I do enough good deeds, then I'll make up for the bad. And, and that's just a constant spinning, right? When have I done enough? I never know when I've done enough. Um, so some people try that and some people just try to say, yeah, I'm just not going to think about it. I want to put it out of mind. Now, that only lasts so long, but uh, neither of those are good solutions. Only the Bible gives us the solution, the knowledge necessary for salvation. Alice, do you want to read John 3.16? You want to play or pass? Yeah, I want to play, sir. Okay. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Thank you. You know, it's such a beautiful passage, probably the most famous passage in the Bible. I'm guessing you've probably all heard that one before. At least once. Yeah. At least once, yeah. 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 But now think about how crazy it is. That doesn't make sense, right? Because going from natural knowledge, right? The one who is more powerful than me, the one that I've wronged, that, that I should expect punishment from, that God so loved the world, sinners like me, that instead of punishing me, instead of saying, here's what you got to do to fix it, he sacrificed. He gave his son. That, that's mind-blowing. We would not have come up with that on our own. You, you think of every, every world religion is exactly the opposite. It's, here's what I have to do to get right with God. If I, if I follow this path, if I, if I uh, uh, do these seven pillars, if I um, you know, am good enough that I get reincarnated 23 times until I, I you know, achieve, all of them have to do with my obedience. The message of the Bible is look at what Jesus has done for me. Right? So that's, that's the revealed knowledge of God. Any question on that first part of this lesson, the... the Natural knowledge and the revealed knowledge. Oh, the John three sixteen. Mm -hmm. You say that um, a lot of books have a surprise ending. Okay. Well, this book has a surprise beginning. Right. Yeah. Uh, if would, like I said, I would, you wouldn't start a story that way. Yeah. In chapter two. Yeah, in chapter two, we're going to look at one of the first passages of the Bible where humans had just sinned and God says, I'm fixing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, not, not the way we would have written it. Um, and, and you think about it, so much good literature is based on this kind of story, right? That redemption, that it's not deserved, but that's not what our nature would tell us, right? Because our nature tells us, you got to make things right. Um, so good. So that's that's the first part. The second part of the lesson then is just a whole bunch of things that God says about himself. Uh, we're going to look at some attributes of God. And with each of them, as we go, you're going to notice how very different it is from what we're used to, from the way humans work. Um, who is God? So what does the Bible say about God? Uh, first, God is a spirit. John 4, 24. We're back to you, Ron, if you want it. So John 4, 24. Um, God is spirit. And his worship must be worship in spirit and, and truth. Okay. We're used to things with physical bodies that you can see and taste and touch and feel. Um, God is not that. He can take physical forms to, to appear 
to us at a time or another, but that's not who he is. He, he is not bound by space and time. Um, so he is spirit. And so our relationship with him is not a matter uh, of just outward physical things. It's, it's spirit. We worship in spirit and in truth. He, he's looking for our hearts. Um, and stop me on any of these if, if you have a thought or, or a comment or a question. So he's spirit. He's eternal. Ara Lou, you want to play or pass? I'll play. Psalm, Psalm 90, 1 and 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Okay. You know, before the mountains were born, um, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He's eternal. We know things that have starts and finishes, right? Um, Ron has 18 birthdays, you know, and, and, you know, I was born on this day. I, I you know, class starts at seven, it ends at eight, you know, the, everything is bound in time. We have a hard time thinking of life in any other way, but God's eternal. Now, I think my mind can kind of comprehend eternity going forward, right? Well, it just never end. Um, I've been in some classes that have felt that way, but, you know, it just keeps on going, right? But when I start trying to think about eternity the other direction, which always has been, well, how did the world get here? Well, God made it. Well, where, when did God get here? Well, he is. He always has been. My mind just says, wait a second, I, I don't get that. And it's not even just that he always has been and always will be, but that he's unbound by time. So he is, you know, he, he one time said of him, you know, who are you, Moses said, he said, I am who I am. He is at every point in time at the same time. So as he's creating the world, he's also seeing us here messing up this creation. And he's seen his son dying for our sins. And he's seen us in heaven because he is at every point in time at the same time, which when we start thinking about why does God do this or why does God do that, um, that'll really play in because, well, he's already, you know, he doesn't have to wait to see what happens next. He's already seen it. He knows what's going on. Yeah. Happen. Yeah. He's there. Um, yeah, so he is eternal. Well, what is it? John says, um, and God is the word and the before. Mm -hmm. In the beginning was the word and the words with God and the word was God. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he does not change. Uh, Olivia, you want that one? You want to play or pass? Well, it has to be true. That was one of the other requirements a while ago. It had to be a truth and the truth can't to start and end and right. it's got to be a forever yeah an absolute truth and an eternal yeah. truth yeah good okay. I the Lord do not change so you O descendants of Jacob are not destroyed okay so descendants of Jacob you believers because right? uh, Jacob aka Israel and so he's talking about the, the believers those who have that relationship with God he says because I don't change you're not destroyed if God would be changing uh, I'm I'm, I'm going to give up on you. Uh, he doesn't change. So we don't have to worry uh, about that. Uh, so his word, you know, this is what Ron was just saying. His word is always true. It's living and active. Um, and he's almighty. The, the Genesis passage, he just calls himself God almighty. Uh, Vicar, you want to read the Matthew 19 passage? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things. Yeah, this was when um, Jesus was teaching and uh, a young man came up to him and, and said, hey, what do, what do I have to do to be saved? And, you know, he, he was coming trying to, to show off. And Jesus said, well, have you kept all the commandments? He's like, oh, yeah, no problem. I've, since I was a little boy, I've always kept all the commandments. Not an issue at all. Uh, and then Jesus said, okay, well, then go home, sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. Uh, and it says he went away sad because he had great wealth. In other words, he hadn't even kept the first commandment. He wasn't willing to put God first. Uh, his, his wealth had, had overcome that. And, and Jesus says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. He said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. So the, the biggest animal they would have seen in their everyday life, the eye of a needle, the smallest opening they could imagine. Uh, and, and so Peter says, so you're saying it's impossible. And that's when Jesus said this. Well, yeah, with man, it's impossible. But there's no such thing as impossible with God. 
he, he does the impossible. With God, all things are possible. You, know, you, you think about uh, um, our, our prayers and what we look to God for. I think a lot of times we fall into the trap of thinking that God is really, really, really powerful. But that doesn't even touch it, right? He's not just more powerful than anyone we've ever seen. He is almighty. There is absolutely no limit. Um, so he can do everything. And, and so if I'm worried about this or that, no, God's beyond that. God's bigger than that. Uh, make sense? Yeah. But you have to believe that for something to happen. For, for me to receive the benefit of it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of examples where God's done things that, that people said, oh, that wasn't God. Mm. You know, he, he says he causes the sun to shine on the righteous and the wicked. Um, he, he's that good that, that uh, whether we believe in him or not, he's going to, to some extent, take care of us. But for the, the big things, for the relationship with him, for, for that salvation, it comes through faith. And actually in lesson four, we're going to dig into what, what faith is and, and get, uh, get deeper into that one. Uh, Cause there, there's a lot, a lot of places we could go there. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. So almighty, not just really powerful. God knows all, the fancy Bible word, omniscient. Uh, Psalm 139, verse 4. Um, and one thing about me, when I'm teaching this, I can never remember who just read and who's about to read. So I think Mickey's next. Is that right? All right. <laughs> Let that one sink in for a second. Before I even say it, you knew what I was going to say. That that could be a scary thought, right? I I uh, I think about this passage always makes me think about the the picture of Jesus that was on the top of the stairs at my house growing up. So uh, once I got to be about eight or nine, I I moved upstairs. You know, the little kids were in the the main level room, and then there were I had thirteen brothers and sisters, so there were a bunch of us up up upstairs. <laughs> And going up the steps, there's a picture, it's the Richard Hook picture of Jesus, like one of the real famous ones. Um, and there's something interesting about that picture. It's got the, the white dots at 11 o'clock on the eyes. You know what that does? So that wherever you are, it looks like he's looking at you. Um, so there were some times when I would walk, when I'd be going up those stairs and, and Jesus is looking at me and I'm like, yeah, this is good. You know, Jesus, I love you. That, that's awesome. But there were other times going up those stairs where, oh, wait, don't look at me, right? Um, <laughs> depend, I need to hide. I need to hide, right? Um, depend, so that thought that God knows everything, even the stuff I don't want to share with anyone else, even the stuff I don't want to be honest with myself about, God knows everything about me. Um, and you say, okay, is that scary? Or is that comforting? Because think about it. This is the God who is all powerful, right? So he can do everything to, to help whatever the situation. And he loves me. He loved me so much. He, he sent his son to die for me. Um, that's the one who knows. If you've ever had a friend that you knew something was wrong, but they wouldn't tell you what it was, that's frustrating, right? Uh, I can't help if you don't tell me. <laughs> that's never a situation with God because he always knows. Um, and, and so God knows all. He's omniscient. Uh, we get another one of the omnis. Next one, omnipresent. God is everywhere. Uh, Sharmita, you want that one? Okay. Um, you know, trying to hide from God. We, we talked about trying to hide from the picture. You know, think of Adam and Eve when they sinned. What did they do? They, they tried to hide. Well, of course you're not going to hide from God. God says that, that's not a possibility. Thank God. Because what happened? Because they couldn't hide from him. He, he found them and he gave the promise of, of our Savior. Um, and God is holy. Uh, Isaiah 6, 3. Nicole, you want to play your pass? <laughs> Okay, these are the, the angels declaring God holy. The, the word holy um, means to be set apart or, or cut off. So 
cut off from sin. Uh, holiness is, is the absolute opposite of sin. Now, remember how before I said sometimes we think that God is really, really, really powerful, but really he's almighty? I think a lot of times we fall into the trap of thinking that God is really, really, really good. No, he's holy. There's a difference. Uh, there is absolutely no sin. Holiness and sin do not mix. One destroys the other. Either the holiness destroys the, the sinner, the sin, or the sin breaks the holiness and it's not holy anymore. Adam and Eve were holy until they sinned, and then they were sinners, and they couldn't be in God's presence without his amazing grace to, to fix the situation. Um, so moral of this one, God doesn't grade on the curve. Right? I, think, I think a lot of people think, as long as I'm better than most, then I'll be okay with God. No, God says, holy. If you want to be with God, you have to be holy, which means we've got a problem. And again, that's where the revealed knowledge of God comes in. God had a solution for that problem. We'll dig into that really intently next week. But, uh, um, you know, he dealt with that sin so that now he can declare us holy. Uh, because God is holy and God is faithful. And when he makes a promise, he, he keeps it. Second Timothy 2. Uh, is that you, Brian? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful. For he cannot disown himself. Okay. Um, we make promises and we try to keep them. God is incapable of not keeping his promises. Because if he didn't, then he wouldn't be God. Because God is faithful. He keeps his promises. Um, God is good. You want that one, Madam? Here. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Pretty straightforward there, right? He is good. Next one's a little more complex because it sounds like a contradiction. Right? God is compassionate and gracious, and God is just. I, I think a lot of times people fall into one extreme or the other. They either think of God as what I call the, the grandfather God. Um, you know, mom and dad, they have to discipline the kids, right? But grandma and grandpa, uh, I'm just going to give you the candy anyway. It's, it's all right. I love you so much. Um, yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, and I think a lot of people look at God like that and they say, well, you know, God is so loving. He loves me no matter what, so I can do whatever I want. Well, that's not quite seeing him accurately. Because he's also just, but but then some some go to the other extreme, and they say, well, uh, um, God is you know this, this angry God just just waiting for me to mess up so he can zap me. Well, that's not exactly it either. He is just and he's compassionate and gracious. In uh, Exodus here, he's describing to Moses. He's he's defining for Moses, for the people of Israel, who he is. Alice, do you want that one? Yes, sir. Uh, Exodus 34, 6, 7. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abound, abound, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation. Okay, thank you. So let's pause on that one a little bit and think about it. Uh, so in, in one, at the beginning of the sentence, you know, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, forgiving, um, yet he punishes sin. Uh, any questions on that one? Why did Martin Luther... himself so that you know i don't know how to say it but, punished himself yeah so believing that that god was punished okay right? so yeah so the uh um he was he was raised to uh understand god's justice and to realize that when we mess up, we deserve punishment. Okay. Um, he didn't in his life have the emphasis on God's grace that um, punished Jesus in his place. Now, God is holy, and so sin must be punished. Uh, again, next week we'll get into how he, you know, 
looking at that whole great exchange thing as he uh, punished Jesus in his place. Um, but it's a truth that that sin must be punished, but it's also a truth that God is, is forgiving and he wants to forgive us uh, as, as we trust in Jesus. Um, you know, there, there's the line in this passage that, that quite often people, uh, you know, catches us up a little bit. He says he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> no, no, that's, we were talking about that at Bible. Oh, okay. Okay. On Wednesday. Yeah. So, um, I guess, you know, the, the, you look at that and you say, wait a second, is that fair? Um, and, and, and there's this question here, well, wait a second, God, why are you punishing the kids for, for the, the parents? And, and one of the things that our goal when we're studying scripture is not to come to a difficult spot and say, I think it must be this, but to come to a difficult spot and then say, okay, God, explain this to me. Uh, and he does. So in, in Deuteronomy, you have almost this exact same passage where, where uh, God um, kind of repeats this. And, and he says, uh, very similar, you know, same thing, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands. Uh, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes his children and their children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Um, so explaining what he means by this, not punishing them because they're the kids of these sinners, but because they're continuing in the sin. Um, you know, as, as the people of Israel are getting ready to go into the promised land, they're going to be surrounded by all these uh, false gods and these other religions. And there's going to be temptations for people to say, you know what, I'm going to try this out for a while. I'm going to try that out for a while. What happens when mom and dad decide, hey, we're going to worship Baal? Um, you know, their worship is more fun. They've, they've got temple prostitutes or whatever else. Um, and, and so mom and dad start doing that. Well, what do the kids do? And then what do they teach their kids to do? Uh, and they pass down that, that sin. I mean, we see it today, right? You know, uh, uh, families, kids that grow up in, in families of, of alcoholics are, you know, what, 84% more likely to struggle with alcohol. Those who grow up in, in houses where there's abuse are, you know, so much more likely to it doesn't mean they have to carry on those sins, but yep, that's what they're trained in. That's what, that's what they know. And so it's very easy for that. And so God gives a warning here. Hey, parents, watch what you're passing on, right? Uh, instead of passing on the wrong, the right. Did you have a question on that? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought. I do have a question. Okay. <laughs> Okay, or were you, was yours on this point? In our legal system, we don't, we're not allowed to, we're not supposed to, um, let the sins of the father reflect on the children. In other words, you've got a bad man, it's a, and a kid over here and hasn't done anything. Right. We're not supposed to hold what the father did against the kid. Yeah. So if he does wind up before a judge, the judge can't go back and say, well, back in 1864, you were a grandfather and so on right. and so on. So the kids, so you just cleared that for me. Let me explain this one. Right. Yeah, it's when they're carrying it on. Uh, and in fact, uh, there, there's a place in Ezekiel where God, um, where the people of Israel were complaining and saying, God, you're taking it out on us because our grandparents messed up. And God comes to them and says, no, 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 you're missing this. Uh, let, me, let me read some of those. So this is Ezekiel 18. Uh, he said, the word of the Lord came to me. What, what do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, our parents messed up and, you know, and, and we're getting punished for it. God says, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For every living soul belongs to me. The father as well as the son, both alike belong to me. The soul who sins is the one who will die. Um, and, and four or five more times in that chapter, he repeats that phrase. So the person who's doing it, that's the one who gets punished for it. And, and, then, and then he kind of tells a, a story. He says, suppose there's a righteous man who does what is just and right. And then, then he lists all, you know, he stays away from the, mount, from the false gods. He, he uh, does the right things. Um, he doesn't oppress people. Uh, but then he has a son who turns from the way of his father and, 
he has a violent son who sheds blood or does any of these other things. He, he eats at the mountain shrines. He oppresses the poor. He commits robbery, etc. cetera. Um, and then that son has a son who sees the sins his fathers commit. And though he sees them, he does not do such things. He goes back to the way grandpa was and, and, and worships the true God. He said, then he goes, he says, so will that first son be rewarded for his father's faithfulness? No, he'll be punished for his sins. Will the grandson be punished for his father's sins? No, he'll be rewarded for his faithfulness. Um, and, and again and again, the soul that sins is the one who will die. So God, God answers the question. Um, it's just a matter of, of letting him, you know, instead of jumping to conclusions, which I think uh, that's one thing we, you know, as we go through this class, we're going to want to try to let God's word guide our conclusions instead of, well, this is what makes sense to me, right? Um, any questions on that? Uh, Sharmita, you said you, you had one? Yeah, I, I was just thinking about this lesson learned from tonight, and talking about the fact that God speaks to us through his word, and having faith is important. Um, and, and I'm an honest individual, I'm human, mm -hmm. and sometimes I have a challenge with keeping faith right. when um, things come about in life. And, and my question is, how should I pray about this? Yeah. <clears throat> um, first answer is honestly and simply, right? You know, just prayer. And we have a lesson on, on prayer that we will get to eventually. But uh, prayer is that that heart to heart talk with God. It's it's God. It's for our good, right? God knows, right? He knows all. He but He wants us to have that relationship with Him, and to communicate with Him. And through that communication, we're blessed because you know how do you build the relationship? You communicate. If 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 you never talk to one another, that relationship isn't going to grow. Um, and, and so as, as you're praying, okay, God, this is how I'm feeling. He, he wants to know that, but, but also, and we'll talk about this, this is in lesson 11 in this conversation. Uh, we speak to him through our prayers, but then we listen to what he says in his word, right? You know, natural knowledge tells us there's, there's something, but it's in his word. He says, this is how I feel about you. And, and this is what I'm doing for you. And, and that's how he answers. So Times like this are important. Your, your daily time in the word is important. You know, worship, uh, you're going to hear God's word. Um, let, that, let that conversation be a, a regular one. I think when things get tough, sometimes the temptation, like, like with Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what they do, they wanted to hide. And they, I don't want to think about God right now. Sometimes when things get tough, we do that, right? We're like, you know what? I want to, I want to pull back a little bit and see if things get better. Like, what? Why would you do that? Right? I mean, it, it's, it's exactly opposite of what would make sense. I should be, you know, God's the one who's going to fix this. So I should be drawn nearer to him. But our, our sinful nature wants to fight that. So, uh, you know, just to, to come back to that question, how do I pray about it? Just do, right? You know, just keep that, that conversation going, um, praying and, and hearing his answer in his word. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Great question. Because I, I think that's, uh, it's so important to be real with stuff like that because it's it's easy to kind of slide away and try, well, this is something uncomfortable, so I'm going to take a step back and then I don't grow. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up. And we're, we're at time. Um, I, I want to be respectful of, of your time. I know some with, with, with kids, I know uh, um, it's, it's time to, to get home and get to bed and everything. Uh, so we won't always finish right at a lesson, um, but there are a couple of lessons that are really short that we'll, we'll catch up, but, but each time we'll just start where we had, we had left off. And again, bring your questions, um, and we'll, we'll start with that next time. Let's, let's close with prayer right now. Lord God, thank you for giving us your words so that we can know who you are, so that we can grow in our relationship with you. Bless each of us with the um, desire to, to keep growing. Bring us back safely next week to, to study your word together again. Keep our minds fresh thinking about these truths that, uh, that we may come up with some questions that, that we can find answers for in your word. And bless us that we may have opportunities to show your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
All right, well, thank you everybody for being here. <clears throat> this is gonna be a fun one, I can tell. <laughs> All right, go for it. That's fine, that's fine, yeah. Okay, in the midst of going to the class, mm -hmm. uh, the individuals that you say did not believe in God, who did they say they believed in or worship with God? I mean, ultimately, when you, when you break it down, it's self, uh -huh. right? You know, they, they, they said, uh, no, this is just an accident. You know, this is just a random planet that happens to have life. And, and we developed out of, you know, and, and um, yeah. there's, yeah, we developed out of chaos and there is nothing. But again, that'd be like a tornado coming through the, uh -huh. um, you know, I, I obviously didn't agree with their thoughts. Yeah. But, you know, that was, well, I've never seen God. So how can you prove God to me? Um, and that's why I tried to, to point to the, the conscience part of it. Um, well, have you ever felt that? Okay, yes, I've felt that. Why? Well, I'm not sure. Okay, well, think about that. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, Satan's powerful. You know, unbelief is, is powerful. It, it takes the power of God's word to, to change that. But it's amazing what people will believe as long as it's not what God says. Um, and so that's why it's so important to, to keep using the tools that God gives us, the power of his word. Um, and yeah, that's what, that's what this is all about. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Alice. You know, I, you would think that, that but they, even, even atheists have a conscience. They've, they've hardened it on some things, right? You know, any of us can harden our conscience. Uh, you know, if, if uh, the, the, the bank robber didn't start by just knocking over a bank. It started by, uh, good night, thank you. By, you know, maybe taking a, a piece of gum and then, you know, and it, you, well, you felt bad the first time, but then the next time got a little easier. And then, yeah, so we can harden the conscience, but there's, people understand right and wrong deep down. Yeah. Well, an agnostic says, I don't know, you can't prove anything, so I don't know. An atheist says, nope, there's no God. Yeah. Who is that? Or the one that wants to make God. You are? Make it a oh, sorry. So, <laughs> country and western singer did a song. And then the song, it says, quote, the devil made me do it on the first time, but I did 